Now let's take a look at some colligative properties. We'll start with a particular one, freezing point depression. And first we should define what is a colligative property. So a colligative property is some property that does not depend on the nature of the solute as it affects the behavior of a solution. That is, it's independent of the molecule, for example, that may be involved in a variation in some solution property. So let's uh, consider a solid in equilibrium with a solution where the liquid form of the solid is the solvent, right? And so that is a, a melting process, for instance, and it's useful to pick a particular example and water is a wonderful solvent and we're used to its solid and its liquid form. So think about ice in contact with an aqueous solution. So in that case, at some temperature, which we'll call the temperature of fusion, it will be the case that the chemical potential of the solid, which is a pure substance, that's what that sub superscript uh, asterisk means, will be equal to the chemical potential of the liquid. That, that's what it means to be at the melting point or the freezing point, that the two chemical potentials are equal at whatever that temperature is. And because this is a liquid solution, its chemical potential will be the chemical potential of the pure liquid plus RT, the log of the activity. And in this case, T is still that T fusion temperature. So if we were to solve generally for the log of the activity as a function of t, just rearranging this expression, I get that the log of the activity is equal to the pure solid chemical potential minus the pure liquid chemical potential divided by rt. And if I differentiate that with respect to temperature, so over here I have partial partial t of log a, and now I've got 1 over r, I'll just pull the constant out, partial partial t of these various chemical potentials. We actually know how to take the partial derivative with respect to t of a free energy divided by a temperature. That's the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation. And we saw it last in video 8.7. And in particular, what you get when you take that partial derivative is negative the enthalpy divided by t squared. So in that case, when I carry through and I, I do that, I'll get that the right-hand side is 1 over r, the enthalpy of the pure liquid minus the enthalpy of the pure so solid. Sorry, I wanted to say solution, but I'm glad I didn't. The pure solid, all divided by t squared. That difference, the difference in enthalpy between the liquid and the solid is called the enthalpy of fusion. And uh, so I will write it that way. It is the enthalpy of fusion divided by RT squared. And so I'm just going to uh, rearrange that to put the DT over on the other side. I get D log the activity is equal to heat of fusion divided by RT squared DT. All right, so move this over to the next slide because I want to continue to work with it. So I now want to, again, do an integration of both sides. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate from the situation where I have a pure liquid. So if it is a pure liquid, I know my activity is 1. And I also know what T fusion is. It's T fusion of the pure substance. But now I want to go to some other temperature which will be relevant to a particular solution. And so the activity must be less than 1 when I start adding something else. So that uh, I'm going to go from A equals 1 to A equals some value. I'll call it A sub 1. And that means I'm also integrating my temperature from T star fusion, the temperature of fusion of the pure substance, to whatever it is for the, for the liquid solution. So I'll carry out that integration. This one's trivial, right? D of log, I get log. So I get log A1 at this limit, and log of 1 is 0. So it drops out. Meanwhile, when I take the integral of 1 over T squared dt, I get a 1 over T minus 1 over T for these two different endpoints. And when I think about simplifying this. So of course what I got to do is put that over a common denominator. So I'll get T fusion over the product of these two minus T fusion star over the product of these two. But if I haven't really changed the temperature too much, the product of these two is pretty close to the square of the pure substance fusion temperature. So I'll just put in this little about equal to because I'm not working with crazy concentrations of stuff necessarily. All right, so now I have this relationship. 
Let's think about what this is. The activity must be less than one, and so the left-hand side is necessarily a negative number. The heat of fusion is necessarily positive. We know that we have to put heat in. We have to add enthalpy, add heat, in order to melt a substance, in order to break the strong interactions in the solid and create a liquid. And as a result, since of course the uh, temperature itself is positive and the gas constant is positive, it must be the case that to uh, all become negative, this term must be negative. It must be that the new temperature at which fusion is taking place, at which melting is taking place, is lower than the temperature of fusion of the pure substance. We have depressed the freezing point. And that's why it's called freezing point depression. So no matter what you add to a pure liquid, you will always give it, give it an activity coefficient below one, and as a result, it always will depress that liquid's freezing point. We've been talking about water, but this is true for any liquid and for any solute added to the liquid. So now let's just uh, define, to make uh, things look a little cleaner, the change in the temperature of fusion, so delta T fusion. And I'm actually going to define it so that it's a positive thing. So I'll take it to be equal to the pure fusion temperature minus the new one, the depressed one. And so when I rewrite that equation, I'm going to put a, a negative sign out here to reflect that I've kind of reversed the, the term that was in parentheses. And I want to uh, recall the case for water, and you can glance back at the last video, that we had this way of relating the log of the activity coefficient of the solvent to some property, to, to some concentration of the solute when things are sufficiently dilute. And indeed, it was the molality of the solute we related to. So I will make that substitution for log A1. And now I'll just solve for delta T fusion, because I may be interested in you know, how much solute do I have to put in to drive the freezing point down a, a certain amount. So delta T fusion is going to be equal to, I'm going to move all these terms over to the other side. So the R appears in the numerator. The T fusion squared appears in the numerator. numerator. In the case of water, I've got this 55.51 moles per kilogram. I can, I've got some value I can look up for the enthalpy of fusion. If I just lump all of these different constants that are constants for a given liquid so solvent into some fixed constant, I'll call it K sub F, the constant for freezing point depression then I know that delta T fusion is just whatever that constant is times the molality of what I'm making. And so for water, it turns out that K sub F is 1.86 Kelvin kilogram per mole. And so you would multiply that number times a molality in order to figure out how much is the freezing point depressed by adding a solute. And I'll emphasize one more time, this is independent of solute. It's got nothing to do with what substance you are making that something molal solution out of. It's just that you added something and drove down the solvent activity. So here's a good chance to try that with a specific example. Uh, we worked with sucrose a couple of videos ago. So here's the question, how much sucrose, table sugar, would you need to add to a liter of water to reduce the freezing point of that sugar solution to about minus two Celsius. I'll let you work on that. So here's the answer to that question. You'll discover you're gonna to need to make an awfully concentrated uh, simple syrup, I believe a bartender would call it, uh, in order to actually achieve that level of freezing point depression. You don't get all that much range uh, in the case of water. And let's actually take a look for a moment at you know, how different liquids might be differentially affected. And remember that the freezing point depression is really dictated by the size of this constant. All right? And the constant depends on these various things that I've now made more general for any given liquid. So that liquid will have some characteristic temperature of melting it will have some characteristic heat of fusion, and it will have a characteristic molecular weight, which will tell you uh, how many moles per kilogram the solvent actually is. So while M was independent of solute, KF is not. 
And just looking at what it's formed from, we know that it will increase, that is, the, the solution will be more susceptible to having its freezing point varied. It will increase for substances that have higher freezing points. So as T gets bigger and bigger, then the opportunity to move T around gets larger. If there are weaker intermolecular interactions in the pure solid, right? because if it's not hard to break the solid apart, that means this will be a small number, the heat of fusion. And then finally, the molecular weight, given its position as a denominator of something in the denominator, as it gets larger, that would flip it up to the numerator, it too will uh, influence things and make that constant larger. So it's easier, if you like, to depress the freezing point of really heavy things with really high freezing points that don't stick together all that much. That's kind of the take home message. I'll let you think about what those might be. That's the end of uh, this particular colligative property, freezing point depression. I do want to look at a couple of others in the next video, and we'll move on to that next.